It's time for a talk by Radford Neal. Radford Neal completed his PhD under Jeffrey Hinton's supervision in 1994. His thesis showed that large neural networks need not suffer from overfitting when trained by Bayesian methods, which has implications for later ideas uh, such as dropout, which can be seen as approximating Bayesian training. His thesis uh, also showed how the sampling needed for Bayesian learning can be done using methods based on Hamiltonian dynamics. He has since done more work on sampling methods, Bayesian modeling, and other topics ranging from error correcting codes, a topic I know a little about, uh, to fast exact summation. Dr. Neal is a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. Bradford? It is bright here. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, you can see things. Okay, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the interplay between uh, uh, deterministic methods and uh, stochastic methods. Uh, so, uh, for instance, deterministic methods like, uh, like uh, non-stochastic gradient descent uh, versus uh, set, uh, stochastic methods such as uh, trying to sample from a probability distribution with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So, so uh, these, so these, these contrasting methods uh, go back uh, many, many decades. Uh, so one th uh, what the place I'll start here is the 1950s uh, with two very foundational papers. Uh, the first uh, many people uh, here may have heard of, uh, the uh, paper by Metropolis Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth Teller and Teller, uh, which introduced what's now called the Metropolis algorithm. Uh, which uh, was the uh, first algorithm of, what is, of the type that's now called Markov chain Monte Carlo, although it wasn't called back, that back then. And uh, this is a, uh, the Metropolis algorithm is a general way of sampling from some complex high dimensional distribution uh, applied by, by, uh, by the original uh, authors to a system of molecules, but it was formulated even back then in a very general way that would let you use it uh, for sampling from any complex probability distribution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that was sort of not recognized outside physics, uh, so the, uh, the fact that this could be uh, applied to statistical learning went recognized, unrecognized for many decades. Uh, the other paper, from, uh, also from the 50s, just a few years after Metropolis's paper, uh, was about uh, what's called molecular dynamics, in which, uh, uh, which uh, was applied at the time also to uh, simulating a system of molecules, just like the original application of the Metropolis algorithm. But rather than doing it stochastically uh, uh, by the Metropolis algorithm that I'll, uh, that I'll explain in a moment here, it's done deterministically, just uh, following how the molecules move around according to the forces between them and uh, from the surrounding environment. And uh, the applications of, of molecular dynamics and physics overlap those of the Metropolis algorithm. There are, there are many uh, problems in physics that you might solve with either of those two. Uh, de just depending on what your preference was. And the reason for that is uh, a connection in physics between, uh, uh, between energy and probability uh, uh, that's, uh, that comes from what's called the Boltzmann distribution or the canonical distribution where uh, in a uh, physical system that's perturbed by, uh, by heat, uh, the lower energy states are more likely than the higher energy states. So here's a, a, a look at the Metropolis algorithm. Uh, the uh, objective here, as for uh, any Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, is we want to sample a sequence of uh, states that I'll call x1, x2, and so forth. x itself uh, would typically be some high dimensional vector. Uh, the index here is, it refers to the time in the sequence. And uh, we're hoping that this sequence of states is going to uh, uh, converge to a uh, uh, a uh, distribution whose density we'll call uh, pi of x. Uh, 
And the way we do that is via a, what's called a proposal distribution that I'll write Q of x star given x. If we're currently at x, that's one of the x1, x2, x3s, or so forth, uh, we've, we want to figure out where to move for the, to the, to the, for the next state in the sequence. And we start by supposing that, well, maybe we should move to x star, which we randomly generate from this proposal distribution. And then, uh, then we figure out whether we're really going to move there or not by uh, uh, deciding whether to accept that proposal, which we do with probability that's the minimum of one and the ratio of the probability densities for x star and x. So that means that uh, uh, we'll always accept a proposal that has higher probability than the, than the uh, state we're currently at. And if it has lower probability, we accept it with a probability that goes down as the uh, ratio uh, gets smaller and smaller. So you can see a, uh, it's an example, uh, not a real example, I just hand drew this on the, uh, on the right. Uh, the, the curves there are contours of the uh, probability uh, density uh, with higher probability towards the center there. Uh, if we start at the black dot at the top, uh, we can imagine that for starters, we, uh, we uh, try proposing uh, that uh, empty circle connected to it. Uh, but that, that's a, a, a proposal to a point of lower probability density. Uh, so uh, we don't necessarily accept that one. And in fact, we'll assume here we rejected it. Uh, and then we proposed, a, proposed another uh, proposal after that. So the fact we rejected it means we keep the original state a second time, which is actually crucial to get the right averages of things. So then we propose one below, which is actually at a higher probability density, uh, if you look at the contours there. And so we'll definitely accept that. And then for the we're now at that state, and we then again make a proposal that's rejected, but then we accept one uh, if we keep going down and to the, uh, to the left. In that case, the proposal that we accepted was actually a lower probability state, if you look at the contours there. But still, we have some probability of accepting it, and we did in this case. And uh, so forth through the uh, uh, other uh, states there. Now, one thing you can uh, see about this is, is, this, is that the exploration of this distribution is done by a random walk, which means that uh, although we went down for the uh, first couple uh, uh, move, mo mo uh, movements there, we then uh, sort of back up and go, go sort of double back almost on where, to where we, uh, close to where we were for the second state. And in general, there's no tendency to keep going the same direction as you went uh, the last few uh, updates. Now one can uh, contrast uh, uh, this with the molecular dynamics uh, method, where we uh, uh, simulate the uh, motion of molecules. Uh, it's, uh, it's fortunate that they don't have to be real molecules. They can be imaginary molecules that uh, represent something else having nothing to do with physics. Uh, under, the, under the influence of forces that might be between them or from outside. And uh, for this diagram, I'll suppose it's just one molecule in two dimensions. Uh, and it has uh, mass one, and it has a position. Uh, uh, I forgot to change that. The position Q should be position X with my uh, change of notation. And it has a momentum P. And uh, there's a physical way that this, uh, this motion should occur, which you can uh, visualize by supposing you have a sort of a curved surface and you have a puck sliding around on that surface. Uh, so the uh, puck will tend to, uh, to slide down, uh, of course, but then it'll have some, uh, some momentum to it. And so it'll, it'll uh, go up the opposite side, even though that's going up rather than down. And it'll slide back and forth and up and down. And uh, that's, uh, that can be written in terms of uh, some uh, dynamical uh, equations here, which are here discretized. So they aren't the, the equations that you see there aren't ones that will give the exact correct physical motion, but instead uh, uh, are a discretized form in which we take time steps of size eta. And uh, this particular f formalism here is called the leapfrog method because uh, of the way it's phrased as we uh, update uh, the momentum by sort of a half step based on uh, the uh, gradient of the potential energy, which is the U function there, which corresponds to the force in physical terms. And then we uh, update the position by a full step, and then we update the momentum by another half step. 
At each stage, we always use the most recently computed values of the variables. Uh, this, this happens uh, for reasons I won't explain to be a particularly nice way of simulating things that's, that's uh, quite accurate while still being quite simple. Uh, if this was completely accurate, uh, then uh, the total energy of the system would be conserved. Uh, the total energy being the sum of the potential energy uh, and the kinetic energy that I've assumed has a particular form here. Um, that's not going to be true uh, uh, when we discretize time in this way, but if the time step eta is small, it'll be almost true. And even if the time step eta is not small, uh, the dynamics here uh, exactly preserves what's called phase space volume. That is, that if you look at the space of x and p, the, uh, the motion sort of, uh, if you look at a little region in xp space and how it, that, the points in that region evolve through these steps, the region sort of may be contorted in various ways, but its volume doesn't change. Uh, so you can also see here in the diagram on the right that uh, the dynamics does not do a random walk. And that's because of the presence of momentum in this, in this arrangement. So I've pictured here the same uh, contours as for the Metropolis algorithm. Here the contours are, are visualized, uh, are contours of U. But there's a relationship here that uh, in statistical physics, uh, as I mentioned, the Boltzmann distribution relates uh, the, the potential energy U with a probability. So that's why I've drawn it with the same contours as for the Metropolis algorithm. Uh, but unlike the Metropolis algorithm, which does a random walk, uh, the dynamics here will systematically keep going in the same direction as given by the arrows, except, of course, it, it can't keep going forever because you'd go off to infinity where you shouldn't be. It'll turn around when it gets to low probability regions. Uh, but it's, it nevertheless, will explore much more um, systematically and therefore more efficiently than doing a random walk that may double back on itself. Ah, there. <laughs> okay, so those are papers from the 1950s. Uh, now we'll, we'll uh, fast forward uh, to the mid 80s and two foundational papers uh, of Jeff's uh, that can be found. I think there's other versions uh, elsewhere as well, but they're, they're both found in uh, what's, what are called the PDP books, a uh, two volume uh, collection of papers uh, on what was called parallel distributed processing at the time. And uh, these, these books give an interesting uh, uh, picture of, of the field at, at that time, which was heavily uh, oriented towards uh, things to do with cognitive science and neurobiology, uh, as well as things to do with AI and learning and so forth. Uh, so these two papers uh, uh, are, in a sense, uh, somewhat similar to the two papers from the 1950s that, I've, uh, that I talked about. The first is, uh, uh, about learning in Boltzmann machines, uh, and the learning in the, the Boltzmann machines are, were implemented using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Even though at the time uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, in the form of the Metropolis algorithm, was mostly only known to physicists, uh, I believe at the time that Jeff had heard of simulated annealing, where the Metropolis algorithm is used as part of a optimization procedure, and uh, but. Uh, but the whole uh, uh, knowledge of Markov chain Monte Carlo was not very widespread at the time. So it's interesting that, that, that Boltzmann machines use, use it. Um, Boltzmann machines ha are, are latent variable models in which you have some random variables that are supposed to capture the hidden features underlying some uh, observation of vis uh, that are in the visible variables. And uh, the Markov chain Monte Carlo is used for sampling those hidden variables uh, conditional on the visible ones. Uh, there's also learning done for Boltzmann machines. The learning is, is strictly speaking, not done by Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's done by gradient descent, uh, but with a gradient that's stochastically evaluated uh, using the Markov chain Monte Carlo for the hidden units of the Boltzmann machine. Now, unfortunately, it actually has to be stochastically evaluated with two Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations and then taking the difference 
Uh, and this is all a very noisy way of getting a gradient. And uh, accordingly, this didn't really work very well in practice. Uh, I think Jeff was very disappointed with this uh, uh, because uh, it, it was uh, sort of one of his most theoretically elegant, way, uh, elegant uh, pieces of work, but then it didn't work all that well in practice. Now, it took a while for him to, tr to determine that. And so, uh, if I recall correctly from things Jeff has said, his involvement in the second paper, uh, which is the famous backprop paper, uh, started out because he figured, well, I've got this Bolson, these Bolson machines, and I, I need to demonstrate they're good, but you need some competitor for that. You have to show it's better than this, right? And, uh, well, ah. Uh, this backprop stuff, it certainly won't work very well. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can implement that and show Bolson machines are better. Uh, well, it didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> backprop turned out to, be, uh, uh, to work quite well. Um, and in a way, backprop, particularly when you do the gradient descent with momentum, is very similar to the molecular dynamics from the second paper of the, of the 1950s. And uh, backprop, as you, uh, as you uh, probably all realize, was this, this backprop paper was, in a sense, the start of the demonstration that, that gradient descent works a lot better than you might have thought. Uh, um, there were precursors to the backprop paper. You can go back and identify other people who did similar things in years before. Um, but uh, it somehow or other, it was only at about this stage that it was realized that this actually does work quite well. So. Uh, uh, hence, the, uh, it's, uh, it's being so well known. So I'll now go onwards just a year here to a very crucial paper from 1987, which uh, initially uh, was uh, uh, not known to anybody outside the lattice field theory uh, uh, community in, in, uh, in the uh, computational chromo quantum chromodynamics uh, area of physics. So uh, this is a, a paper on what they called hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, which uh, we sort of renamed Hamiltonian Monte Carlo because hybrid is a very generic word, whereas this paper uses the Hamiltonian formulation of dynamics, and so that's uh, why we call it that. Um, essentially, this is a paper that combines the two papers from the 1950s. The, uh, the Metropolis algorithm is used in, in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but rather than some simple-minded idea that you just add Gaussian noise to your current state to get a, a uh, proposed state, instead you do a complex molecular dynamics style simulation in order to get the proposed state. So this uh, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo combines the stochastic nature of the Metropolis algorithm with the deterministic nature of molecular dynamics in order to get a, a, a method that has uh, uh, substantial ad advantages over just simple-minded stochastic methods. So that's, in a sense, the, uh, the topic of my talk is the interplay here about uh, combining deterministic and stochastic methods. So uh, in order to apply this in general, you have to generalize the idea that you're doing molecular dynamics, so you're just doing dynamics of things that uh, uh, involve, that involve a position X, which uh, could be a position of a molecule or the set of positions for a whole bunch of molecules, but it can instead be whatever you're interested in. It doesn't have to have anything to do with physics. And we associate with X a momentum, P, of the same dimensionality. We let them be independent of the distribution we say we're interested in. And uh, we give them the, the uh, density uh, for those two to be, for x, the distribution we're interested in, which we sometimes can express as exponential of, of uh, minus some potential energy function, or proportional to that at least. And we let uh, the momentum have some simple distribution that uh, we can sometimes think of as being uh, uh, due to a kinetic energy. And then when we sample for x and p, because they're independent, uh, well, even if they weren't independent, if we're only really interested in x, we just ignore p in the end, and we have what we want. So here's a, a picture of how that works. We want to now sample pairs of x and p, a sequence of those that converge to the uh, distribution we're interested in, in which the distribution of x is what, we're, is what we want. And, uh, we, uh, we do a metropolis uh, algorithm style proposal of an x star p star, which we get by simulating uh, 
uh, trajectories with some number of leapfrog steps. And then we negate P at the end of the proposal, which means that it's a symmetrical proposal. If we, because we switch the direction we're moving in, if we were to do it over again, we'd get back where we started. And then we accept, we accept or reject uh, X star, P star, according to the metropolis criterion. Uh, the idea is we, we would usually accept, because if we simulated the dynamics exactly, uh, the total energy would actually be constant. And uh, so if we move to a point with the same probability density, uh, then the metropolis algorithm will always accept. Uh, now we'll actually simulate the dynamics uh, approximately, so we will sometimes reject, but we hope not very often. Um, and then uh, after we do that, we just completely resample the momentum from its distribution. Uh, and this is an exact uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method because the inexact simulation of the dynamics um, is exactly compensated by the occasional rejection of a point. Uh, it's also crucial that these leapfrog steps, even though they don't exactly conserve the energy, do exactly conserve the volume in the phase space. Uh, that means that uh, there's no funny uh, Jacobian factor here that has to be compensated for. So you can see on the uh, right a picture of this in which uh, it's uh, for a bivariate Gaussian where I've done the one standard deviation ellipse there. So it's a highly correlated two-dimensional Gaussian. And uh, what's shown in the dotted line there is a, uh, is a trajectory used to propose a new state uh, using, uh, the, using some number of leapfrog steps. You can see it's, it's a discrete, you can see discrete jumps there, whereas the real uh, mathematical trajectory would be smooth, but we do it in finite time steps. And you can see that it moves systematically from near the center of the distribution towards the end until it has to start doubling back because it's sort of coming to the low probability part of things. And uh, this is also, this is avoiding doing exploration by a random walk because it keeps going in the same direction for, for quite a while. Uh, uh, while, the, while there is still a stochastic element here in that we, uh, we randomly figure out what directions to start moving in according to how we sampled P, and we randomly decide to accept or reject uh, if the, uh, if the uh, uh, end point is, is higher energy. Okay, so uh, now we come to, the, to the, what the world was like in 1989, which is when I started doing my PhD with Jeff. Uh, so at the time, Jeff and his students were using backprop and uh, trying to get Boltzmann machines to work better using a, a mean field approach, which I think in the end didn't work out too well. Um, neural networks and, and, and other ideas of, the, of what was called connectionism uh, were at the time a minority approach in AI with uh, symbolic approaches being more dominant. Now at, uh, at U of T, uh, this didn't really produce conflict. Uh, the uh, the uh, connectionists and the symbolic AI people got along fine as, long, as far as I can tell. Uh, maybe that wasn't true everywhere, I'm not sure. Uh, there was also much debate about whether probability was of any use in AI. Um, although when you get to things like speech recognition, even at the time, probability was heavily used for doing things like hidden Markov models. Uh, there was also a lot of hype, uh, possibly mostly from a few years before, about what are called, were called expert systems uh, built uh, with manually codified uh, knowledge uh, found by interviewing experts, uh, sometimes in terms of manually specified probabilities, sometimes uh, non-probabilistically. Um, most ML researchers didn't know much about statistics, really, and even fewer statisticians knew anything about ML. Uh, Jeff's group was, in that respect, perhaps more statistical than most, in that, as you, as, uh, you can see, the Boltzmann machine was heavily probabilistic and such. Um, uh, so uh, uh, there was probability and statistics sort of implicitly around in, uh, in Jeff's group. Uh, but, uh, but still, uh, I think uh, we didn't know as much about statistics as, as uh, people, as, as ML researchers do nowadays. Uh, so, uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD with Jeff, Jeff had about 10 other grad students, I think. Uh, I had some difficulty convincing him to take on an 11th. Uh, and it was, a, it was a very stimulating group because uh, there was, there was uh, lots of uh, 
of ferment in, in what sort of uh, intellectual uh, tools one used and such. There was AI and cognitive science and neurobiology, statistics, statistical physics and philosophy and such. They were all sort of uh, fermenti uh, fermenting there in, in, uh, in Jeff's group. So uh, in particular, I was uh, uh, rather dissatisfied with the ad hoc nature of, of, some, uh, of, of most machine learning methods, and in particular with the, the sort of vexing issue of how to avoid overfitting, where, uh, where you're uh, training your, your network along here, and it initially gets better, but then uh, it starts getting worse because you've overfitted to the, to the training data. And the, uh, the perhaps dominant approach was that you had to limit network complexity in order to avoid that. Uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat paradoxically, really, I think this was a, a notion particularly prominent amongst the few statisticians who, who looked at this. And so you would see uh, sort of solemn discussions about whether, uh, uh, whether you, you should use a neural network with two hidden units or with three hidden units. Uh, doesn't seem too sensible from, uh, from today's perspective. Uh, so it didn't seem too sensible to me as, uh, at the time either. And uh, I found that I, I thought that Bayesian methods uh, were more attractive as a, as a uh, approach to uh, uh, doing sort of more principled inference uh, for machine learning. Uh, Bayesian methods go back uh, hundreds of years, um, but uh, sort of coming in and out of fashion, uh, the, uh, at the time, the sort of upswing in Bayesian methods, although there was still very much a minority view in statistics, had started back in the 50s as well. Uh, um, but still, uh, there, there was also a bunch of confusion within the Bayesian community, I think. And you can look back at, uh, at uh, papers from them, and you can identify some of them that seem perfectly fine from today's perspective, but others that look a bit strange. Uh, so uh, anyway, the... Uh, the uh, uh, attraction of Bayesian methods for me was first of all that they express prior beliefs about what might be, so what the correct classification relationship might be, for instance, in terms of probabilities, and then you update those as you get data, which seems like a very philo philosophically coherent approach. And uh, I found that they avoid overfitting even with large models. So one of the uh, key results in my thesis was how even, even if you have an infinite number of hidden units or looking at the infinite limit for, for neural networks, you still get perfectly sensible models if you do things in the right way. So you could have uh, lots of hidden layers, each of which has arbitrarily many hidden units, and you still get good answers if you do proper Bayesian training. So the whole idea about, well, you should maybe only have two hidden units because you don't have much data, it goes out the window. You can, you can have those infinite networks even with a very small amount of data is, if you do everything properly. Um, another thing you can do with Bayesian methods is you can learn uh, what are called hyperparameters, which are high-level parameters controlling the distribution of lower-level parameters. At least that's uh, the, the sort of correct use of hyperparameters. People use the word hyperparameters to mean all sorts of things nowadays. Uh, and uh, because you can infer those in the, in the same sort of uh, um, framework as, as uh, inferring the low-level hyperparameters, you can then learn things like which are the actually relevant features for classification, because you can have a hyperparameter controlling how much attention you pay to that feature. And finally, uh, Bayesian methods let you uh, quantify uncertainty, uh, uh, because they, they make predictions based on looking at the whole parameter space and integrating over it, rather than looking at just a single estimate. So uh, the problem is that uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, even modest-sized neural networks are much more complex than traditional statistical models, uh, which, uh, which, which are traditionally quite small. So uh, there's an example where you have 241 parameters, which doesn't seem much nowadays, but with still too many for lots of, uh, lots of statistical approaches. And they're also hard to visualize uh, what the posterior distributions of, over the parameters are like. And so in, in 1990, the traditional computational methods of Bayesian statistics were hopelessly inadequate for this sort of thing. And even the, uh, this is the time when uh, statisticians first became aware of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Uh, uh, but even the, the uh, simple Mar Monte Carlo methods uh, of the time wouldn't have been adequate for Bayesian neural networks. 
So uh, there was uh, much, uh, much debate about how one should do this, uh, do Bayesian learning amongst the few people who were interested in doing it. Uh, so David Mackay uh, was uh, a big advocate of, advocate of doing uh, Bayesian inference for neural networks and other things. And so he looked at methods based on, a, on approximating the posterior distribution with a Gaussian, which you can uh, uh, also do in, which you can do in various ways. Uh, but uh, because the complex nature of the uh, posterior distribution for a Bayesian neural network seems, uh, seems sort of similar to the complex nature of, of the distributions over molecules in a liquid or something like that, it's maybe not surprising that methods from physics will turn out to be useful for, uh, for uh, Bayesian neural networks. And that was the, uh, the uh, big break breakthrough from my point of view, is when I realized that uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, would be a method that's applicable to doing uh, Bayesian neural networks. Uh, now, it, this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo was unknown outside the lattice field theory literature at the time. So uh, I, I count it as one of my major accomplishments to actually recognize that this method from the lattice field theory literature uh, could be applied to uh, machine learning uh, for Bayesian neural networks and, uh, and then to manage to extract the relevant parts from all the quantum chromodynamics terminology that I didn't understand. So uh, there are three characteristics to uh, HMC that make it very suitable for this. One is that it uses the information in the gradient. And in a backprop network, you're sort of throwing away a lot of easily obtained information if you only look at the output and not the gradient, because the gradient has, there's a lot more numbers in the gradient than in just the output. So you'd like to use all those numbers. And uh, HMC ends up computationally being very similar to standard backprop with momentum in this respect. Um, because it proposes distant points by simulating long trajectories uh, that have a good probability of being accepted, it avoids inefficient exploration by a random walk. Remember, if you do a random walk where, you, where there's no particular tendency not to double back on yourselves, if you do n steps, you're likely to end up only a distance square root of n away from where you started because of that doubling back. And so it's very, very bad to do random walks in small steps here. Uh, so uh, HMC avoids that. And uh, a somewhat more technical point is it scales better with dimensionality than simple uh, metropolis updates. Um, so uh, Bayesian networks implemented with Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo do very well uh, for classification regression problems of small to moderate size. So, uh, for instance, uh, I used them in, uh, for the winning entry uh, for the NIPS 2003 feature selection challenge, which had five machine learning problems with uh, quite a few features, quite a few training cases, and so forth, where quite a few here is in the thousands, not the millions. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a sign of, of, of the times there in 2003 that at the, uh, at the uh, pre presentation to the, to the winners, um, uh, the organizer, Isabel Guillaume, uh, remarked, uh, with, uh, pleasant, remarked with some su surprise, uh, although pleasure, uh, that the winning entry had actually used neural networks. Uh, at the time, uh, things like support vector machines were the sort of hot thing. Uh, and so uh, uh, nowadays, of course, it wouldn't be too surprising that the winner would be using neural networks, but at the time, it apparently was. Uh, so although these are, these are Bayesian neural networks work quite well uh, uh, for problems of moderate size, at least, they're not going to work very well if you have millions of training cases uh, with millions of parameters in your model, at least if you do it in the most obvious way, because it's, first of all, everything is done in batch mode, not with mini batches. And, uh, um, and even though HMC has good scaling with dimensionality, it's not quite good enough to go to millions of parameters. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, there, is, there are still practical limitations here which contrasts a bit with the theory uh, in my thesis in which I show that you can have these infinite size hidden units, uh, hidden layers, uh, and still get good results. I recall uh, at one point I was discussing some experimental results with Jeff uh, about what uh, results I'd gotten with some networks. Uh, uh, and uh, he remarked that he wasn't quite sure that the sort of 
properties of the network uh, deduced from the infinite limits were, were necessarily applicable to the, to the networks I was fitting. Uh, and so I had to try to convince them that for the, in the context here, the number five was sufficiently close to infinity for practical purposes. <laughs> so uh, I don't think I necessarily convinced them of that. Uh, so uh, even though uh, Bayesian neural networks uh, are, are not directly applicable to something with millions of training cases, they're nevertheless uh, uh, a, good, a good demonstration that you don't have to limit complexity to avoid overfitting. And this uh, does extend to large-scale problems, and in particular to things like dropout, which uh, has been interpreted uh, as, as being an approximation to Bayesian uh, inference for neural networks. So uh, the, uh, the uh, result from this is that we see that a deterministic method, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, well, a, a, a method that has a, a big deterministic component, although also a stochastic component, is uh, enormously more, more useful uh, for, for Bayesian neural networks than simple things like uh, uh, random walk metropolis methods. I haven't given any figures on that, but by enormously more, it's like thousands, tens of thousands of times faster than doing simple metropolis methods. So we might then wonder whether putting determinism into other problems that uh, uh, you might think uh, would naturally be stochastic can also be useful, in particular, whether you can do deterministic stuff in, Mar in Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that will improve them over the obvious stochastic only approach. And some things you might do are try to do metropolis for a, uh, accept rejection, or, or try to do something deterministic regarding accept reject decisions, or choosing proposals, which is what HMC does, or for sampling from univariate conditional distributions, doing that successively is what's called Gibbs sampling, or indeed for everything. And so uh, uh, I'll start with the everything. Um, there's two papers from 2012 that hint that maybe you don't really need anything stochastic at all in, to do MCMC, or at least only a very small amount. Uh, one, one paper is by Murray and Elliott, and the other by me. Uh, they describe very closely related methods that are, differ a bit in the, in the motivation. Murray and Elliott wanted to consider whether you could use low quality random numbers without actually getting a wrong answer. Um, I considered various applications, one of which is where you want to do parallel simulations uh, on multiple cores, uh, but you're not confident that you can have independent random number streams, so you, you're worried that, and if you use the same random number stream, you sort of just get the same answer from all of them, so uh, uh, that doesn't seem attractive. So the, uh, the uh, simplest version of this, uh, these, these these methods actually sort of are general for any MCMC method to some extent, but a simple version for Gibbs sampling is that when you want to sample a, 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 from the conditional distribution for X, uh, a typical way to do that is you generate a, a value U that's uniform over the interval 0 to 1, and then you apply the inverse cumulative di distribution function to U to get a X from the right distribution. And so we do that, except rather than generating u randomly from the uniform distribution over 0, 1, we just use the value of u that we have around from the previous iteration. So that gets us an x from that u. And then we update u by taking the cumulative distribution function applied to the previous x. That means that if we were to try to go backwards, we actually would go backwards so we're, we're getting the u, which would take us back to where we were before if we were to be going backwards, and that's crucial to why this actually works. Um, and then finally, we add some constant to u, wrapping around. If it goes past 1, we wrap it back around 0, right? We consider it a circle. So that's a, uh, um, if, we, if, the c, if the value c that we add to u is, is, uh, is fixed deterministically, uh, then this is a completely deterministic procedure, aside from the question of what u value we started with. So here's an example of this uh, uh, sampling from a truncated bivariate Gaussian. So it's, uh, it's just a two-dimensional Gaussian, except we chop off parts just to make it a bit more interesting. And what we see here is just ordinary Gibbs sampling, uh, nothing new here. Applied to this, this problem, we sample uh, 
we sample from the conditional distribution for x2 given the current x1, and then for x1 given the current x2, and then so forth. I've shown here uh, six chains in different colors. On the left is the plot of the x1, x2 points from those chains. And on the right is the plot through time, is for, for 250 iterations, what the value of x1 was. So you can, uh, that's sort of, uh, you can see the binary dot Gaussian distribution there on, on the left. And here's a, uh, uh, a run of the deterministic scheme. Uh, the six chains are different in that they start with different values for, for u, and uh, I'm not sure about x1 and x2, I can't remember whether I kept those the same or different. Um, but thereafter, they, they behave absolutely identically. They, they ha use the same C value in each iteration for all six chains. Uh, but those are random C values in this case. So this corresponds to the case where you had only one random number uh, stream, and you wanted to do uh, six runs on, uh, on six cores, uh, but you, you, uh, you use the same random numbers all the time. And uh, what we can see is, is you can do that, and as long as you have different starting points, you get six chains that look almost the same as uh, in this one. If we, if we look at that, those two plots and you look at these two plots, they look very similar to my eye at least. And so even though we're, we're doing the six chains are actually all using the same random numbers, because we're doing this deterministic scheme, they actually sample differently. This is, uh, if you instead had used um, uh, um, the same random number seed uh, for, for, for all six, six chains and you'd done it in the normal way, then in fact these chains would coalesce. That's a, a, a very useful property of, of things in other circumstances, but the exact opposite of what we want here. So now let's go further. Rather than having a random Cs at each iteration, even though they're the same for all six chains, we'll uh, just set all the C values to 0 0.211. And uh, this is what we get in this case. This is now very, very deterministic. The only thing that's maybe random here is the choice of the initial values for you uh, for the six chains. And you can see that even though we're doing things very, very deterministically, we again seem to be getting the right bivariate normal distribution. And in fact, it seems like it's actually doing better than standard Gibbs sampling. If you look at the plot on the right, you can see that there's less random walk aspect to things. There seems to be, a, you can sort of visually see a bit of a systematic scan upwards and downwards there, uh, where as compared to the more randomish thing for these two, if you compare on the right there, this is the same distribution, but more even, right? Less random variation within the distribution. Well, let's suppose we don't set them all to 0.211, but to 0.017. You get a much prettier picture here, I think. Uh, and it looks like maybe these things are sampling from the correct distribution, although maybe, uh, maybe not quite as efficiently as they could. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. And here's what you get if you set all the Cs to zero. Well, it doesn't seem it works in this case. It's a pretty picture, but clearly is not giving us the right distribution. So uh, you can't, uh, this is uh, sort of going too far in the deterministic uh, 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 scheme of things here. It seems that one needs to uh, do a little bit of perturbation even if it's not entirely random. So uh, this is, a, I think, an interesting uh, sort of uh, 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 thing to look at. Uh, I have actually looked at doing things for some higher dimensional problems of this sort, and you can get, uh, get speed-ups compared to ordinary Gibbs sampling that relate to it not doing as much of a random walk. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I'll go on from, uh, from this at the moment and talk about a little paper from 1991. Um, which considers doing Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but with only one step in the trajectories. Now, the whole point of Mont Hamiltonian Monte Carlo was to do multiple steps so that you got to a distant point and avoided doing a random walk. Uh, if you do only one step, which is also sometimes called Langevin Monte Carlo, uh, you, you will be doing a, a, random, a random walk. But Horowitz had, had a little trick here that uh, would uh, nevertheless keep you going in the same direction. 
Uh, this is an early example of what's called a non-reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo method. And uh, this might be helpful because uh, you sometimes want to do other sorts of Markov chain Monte Carlo updates is in addition to the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, but if you spend a, long, a lot of computation time on this long trajectory for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, then uh, uh, you don't get to do the other updates very often, and that may be disadvantageous. Uh, so uh, it'd be nice if this worked better. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work all that well. It doesn't work as well as regular not Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. But here's the trick. The trip, trick is you do uh, uh, updates in three steps. First of all, you update p uh, to alpha p plus uh, square root one minus alpha squared times the noise. That's just a slight perturbation of p if alpha is close to one. Uh, and then uh, that means you haven't changed p very much. And then you do a proposal with one leapfrog, leapfrog step, negating p at the end of that proposal. And you accept or reject the usual way. And then finally, you negate p. All of those are valid updates. And if you actually accepted, the, neg the negation in producing the proposal would be canceled by the negation in step three. And, uh, and you're, even though you're taking one step at a time, you would mostly be going in the same direction. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the problem with this uh, method is that to keep the number of rejections very small so that you do mostly keep going in one direction, you have to use a very small step size, which is inefficient. So uh, the uh, idea here uh, is to uh, uh, do a non-reversible modification of the accept-reject decision. Uh, so rather than, so we can uh, phrase the accept reject decision as whether uh, some uniform 0, 1 value u is less than the ratio of densities for the proposed and current state. And uh, the idea is rather than choosing u randomly from the interval 0 and 1, we'll instead uh, keep it around in the state and we'll just move it a little bit reflecting off the boundaries. Uh, we keep moving it, we have to, we have to do a little bit of, uh, of change when we actually accept something, but the idea is to systematically move it. Now you might wonder why does that, uh, um, why does that help? Uh, I'll skip another application of that thing. And the idea is that if we uh, uh, can, even if we have to, even if we have a, lot, a fairly large number of rejections, which is very bad for Horowitz's method, if we can manage to cluster the rejections together, then, uh, uh, then we'll still have long periods when there's no rejection and which we keep going in the same direction. So uh, you can see that uh, actually happening here. Here's a plot of, uh, of uh, this modified Horowitz method uh, for over 200 iterations. And what I'm showing is the value of u used for the accept-reject decision. And the, uh, rejections are shown in red. So we see we systematically, in a deterministic sort of way, with a bit of, uh, of randomness, uh, move uh, u from 0 to 1, and then back towards 0, and back towards 1. And when it's close to 1, rejections are more likely. So we get a bunch, a cluster of rejections there. When it's, clo when it's close to 0, rejections are unlikely. And so we manage to. Uh, uh, by clustering the rejections together, even though there's just as many of them as there were before, we get long runs where we have no rejections and can do large motions without doubling back on ourselves. And that, uh, in fact, uh, improves the sampling uh, for uh, this simple method on a bi uh, bivariate Gaussian distribution. Uh, and then uh, I've tried, uh, also, also tried this for a neural network model. This is all in, in the last uh, week or so, so I haven't done extensive tests. Uh, so I tried, it, tried uh, the improved version of Horowitz method for a simple Bayesian neural network uh, with, uh, with uh, just um, 12 hidden units and two inputs and such. So this is, this is quite small even for Bayesian neural networks. Uh, Bayesian neural networks can be feasibly done for much bigger uh, networks, but this is a, a sort of an initial starting point. And uh, preliminary results show that if you do the one-step HMC method, but with a, with a non-reversible accept-reject modification, then uh, that almost matches the performance of multi-step HMC when you fix the hyperparameters. 
Now, one reason for trying to do this, though, is that you want to sample for the hyperparameters in, in, with other updates. And so by uh, doing only one step HMC, you'd hope to be able to sample the hyperparameters more often and get better exploration in hyperparameter space. And that uh, actually does seem to, uh, uh, to uh, be the case, although you can't sample them too often because that seems to introduce too much randomness in the, uh, in the, uh, at the HMC level. Uh, so, uh, so I think this is interesting as a way of, uh, of allowing HMC to be integrated better with uh, things like hyperparameter updates or updates of discrete random variables which HMC can't handle. Uh, if you have to do long trajectories, you don't get to do those other updates very often, but if you can uh, do efficient one-step HMC updates, then uh, maybe uh, you can uh, do the, the other updates more often and get a benefit from that. So I think that's... Yep, that's the end of Thank you. Thank you, Bradford. <laughs>